Hello everyone, welcome to Photo Wildlife Park. My name is Linda. I work here in the Wildlife Park as a Head of Education. Um, and for those of you who have come to the park before, no doubt you've seen all of the amazing animals that currently call the Wildlife Park home. But what you may not have seen are many of the native species that also live here. Uh, and this morning, myself and my colleagues, Rachel and Donald, we're going to take you on a, a little bit of a tour to show you where you might find those animals so that the next time you visit, you might keep an eye out for them as well. So let's go guys, let's go and take a little walk and see who exactly we can find uh, in a number of areas around the wildlife park itself. So who can we spot here? This is a red squirrel. It's one of about 52 that actually live uh, within Photo Wildlife Park at the present moment. Um, red squirrel, very, very important, belongs to a group of animals called Order Rodentia. And believe it or not, it makes up about 41% of all of the mammal species currently found on Earth. It includes not just squirrels, but Order Rodentia also includes animals like beavers, um, dormice, voles, mice, rats, and even koi poo, believe it or not. So what's it like for the red squirrel to live in the park? What does it do here and what does it feed on? It lives high up in the in a variety of trees here in the wildlife park uh, in a nest known as a dray. Um, normally they live in their drays on their own. During the winter period to help them to stay warm they might actually decide to share their dray with perhaps one or two other red squirrels in the area as well. The little red squirrel is known as a grainivore and what that means is that he feeds mainly on seeds from different trees, um, even ones that you'll see here like the pine cone for example. So an obvious sign that red squirrels actually live here in the wildlife park as well. So there are lots of these scattered across the woodland floor right throughout the wildlife park and outside the, the boundary fence of the wildlife park as well. Of course if food comes in short supply it might decide to change its mind. It could feed on things like fungi. Um, it feeds on buds and shoots of different plant species within it, um, but its preference certainly is for, for seeds more than anything else here. Males are known as boars and female red squirrels are actually known as sows. Um, the breeding season for them can start if the weather is very, very mild in December, then it could start in December and it could right th run right through to the following autumn as well. So it can be quite an extensive breeding period for them. The babies are known as kits or kittens and mums will have anything from two to eight kits or kittens in their litters at any one time. So that's a, a huge family for the, the female to actually rear. Normally once they reach an age of two to three months then they decide to leave the dray and they live independently as well. You can see from them that they have a, a thick coat, very important to keep them warm during the winter months, a very long bushy tail which is a balancing aid for them, Sharp claws, very, very important for climbing as well. And during the winter months, they don't actually hibernate like a lot of people would assume. In actual fact, they go into what we call torpor. And torpor is just a short period of inactivity. So they may decide that when the weather gets very, very cold, that they may decide to actually stay in their drays or nests for two or three days at a time with the aim of actually saving energy. So in winter, the red squirrel has to have a backup plan. And what it decides to do in actual fact is that in the months prior to winter, it gathers much food, it spends about 75 to 90% of its time foraging for food and it decides then to, to store it in what we call a midden. So a midden is almost its outdoor refrigerator. Right throughout the winter period it'll go back and forth, depending on the weather, to actually feed from that refrigerator as well. So a very, very unique behaviour. The red squirrel in Ireland is near threatened. It's a protected species. It's protected under the Irish Wildlife Act of 1976, the Irish Wildlife Amendment Act of the year 2000. And why it's threatened effectively is from the introduction of the grey squirrel back in 1911 and since 1911 the population of red squirrels in Ireland has dropped by about 20 percent so it's quite significant as well so they really are an important species for for us to help protect and save long term as well so we're going to be looking for your help later on we're going to give you ideas as to how you at home can actually help protect the red squirrel by maybe setting up and planting your own trees um, and Donald will actually explain to you how to do that as well so that's just a little bit of information about the red squirrel that's found here in Photo Wildlife Park. But of course, there are so many more native species that are also found here that we'll ask you to look out for the next time that you come here. Among them, the hedgehog. Although if you come here in the depths of winter, unfortunately, you probably won't see it. And the one reason for that is, of course, pretty soon it's going to go into hibernation and it'll stay in hibernation in a deep winter sleep for anything up to three or four months, only to emerge in late springtime when the weather gets a little bit better and when food is in plentiful supply as well. And of course, one that you probably will find really hard to spot will be Ireland's smallest mammal. Let me show you where they could possibly be found. So boys and girls, you might just be able to spot Ireland's smallest mammal here in the leaf litter. This is a pygmy shrew. It's 
a very unusual animal in the sense that it is active across the 24 hours of the clock. Um, unfortunately, it has a pretty tough life, I would say, in a sense that it has to eat the equivalent of one and a half times its own body weight on a daily basis to guarantee it can survive. So that means that it spends nearly 24 hours a day out searching for food. In actual fact, it feeds mainly on animals like flies and beetles and over 50% of its diet are actually made up of those two types of animals alone. The big thing is, is that when you are here in the park, keep an eye out. Some are very large, some are very, very small, all equally as important, all native species to Ireland and all the more reason for you and I to ensure that we can conserve them long term. Donald here from Photos Education Team to tell you a little bit about badgers. Badgers are an omnivorous nocturnal mammal and they are easily recognized by the striking black and white stripes on their face. Omnivores are animals who can eat both plant and animal material, which is an advantage to badgers because they're able to switch their diet at certain parts of year, depending on what's available to them. So for example, in the winter, when certain things like insects might start to die off, given the cold and harsh conditions, they can switch their diet onto something like the arrows from a yew tree or other berries such as holly and ivy that they can find in their habitat. That said, at most parts of the year, badgers can feed on up to 200 earthworms in a single night and they usually make up about 60% of their diet. Nocturnal animals are those who only come out at night. So to adapt to that, badgers need to be able to find their way around in the dark. They don't have particularly good eyesight, but they do have a super sense of smell, which is an advantage to an animal that spends a lot of its life underground as well. So badgers live in underground tunnel systems called sets, which can run for up to 300 meters, uh, can have up to 40 openings, and can home as many as 15 badgers in a single set. Due to their nocturnal underground lifestyle, many people may have never actually come across a badger. If you do want to go looking for them, you will first have to look for possibly their tracks. And certainly the easiest way of tracking animals is if you can find their poo. At certain times of year, the badger's poo will be easily, easy to identify because it will be full of the, what's left behind by berries in terms of the yew tree that we were talking about before those seeds will actually remain in what's known as the scat or badger poo if you're looking for it and if you can find enough of that it may indicate that you're in the right area to find them before even that you'll have to know where they live so if you're looking for their habitat habitat it's either into a woodland or into some open fields with plenty of hedgerows where they have the opportunity to build a set once you've found such things as their droppings or maybe even some footprints like tracks that you can find around their habitat you can start looking for something like a hole that the badger will have dug as an entrance into their set which will be about 15 to 30 centimeters across and shaped like a capital d on its side so curved at the roof and flat underneath when you found that if you put yourself out there at the right time of day so late into the evening as it's getting dark you might be lucky enough to see badgers emerging from their set to start to forage looking particularly for earthworms but for anything else that they can possibly find if you situate yourself with your back to a tree and downwind Badgers won't be able to see you because they don't have a great sense of eyesight. And if you're downwind, it means that they're not going to be able to pick up on your scent either, which means you can actually spend quite a while observing them, even though they're in very close proximity, because they won't know that you're there. So hopefully this will help you to develop some interest in heading out at night and having a look for some badgers in their native woodland habitats. And we wish you the best of luck in your efforts. Now, Rachel is going to tell you a little bit about red foxes. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I'm another member of the education team here in Photo Wildlife Park. Like Donald, we've just stepped outside the wildlife park to the woodlands surrounding the park itself to have another look at one of Ireland's most recognisable animals. The red fox is a very, very familiar animal to most people, easily recognisable by its red fur and long bushy tail. It's a very successful member of the dog or canid family. Red foxes are found in a variety of habitats all around the island of Ireland. They're found in woodlands, grasslands, mountain areas, and nowadays have even found their homes in our towns and cities. They are omnivores, and as Donald mentioned, omnivores are animals that eat plant and animal material. In this woodland, foxes sit at the top of the food chain. They feed on animals like rats, mice, rabbits, and even birds. They'll forage amongst vegetation for earthworms, beetles, and insect larvae, and occasionally will ingest berries and fruit as well. As a predator, they have specific adaptations in order for them to hunt and catch the food that I've mentioned previously. They have eyes at the front of their head, this for judging distance. They can work out how far away the prey is before they make the run for the kill. As mentioned, small mammals play a big role in the diet of the red fox and they're highly adapted to be able to locate these small mammals within this habitat. They have an amazing sense of hearing. A red fox can hear 
the squeak of a mouse from 25 meters away. A group of red foxes is known as a skulk. The mum or female is called a vixen, the dad or male is called a dog fox, and the young foxes are known as cubs. The mum gives birth underground in a den called an earth, and she will stay with those cubs for up to six weeks exclusively. This means the male fox will come and actually give food and leave it for her underground in that earth. So foxes may not always be welcome in certain habitats. Being a predator, they may occasionally be seen as a threat. However, they have a very important job in this woodland. Being a predator, their job is to keep the number of small mammals like rabbits or rats under control. If you want to help out Irish wildlife, one of the best things you can do is planting native trees. This directly increases the number of native plants and in the long run will provide food and shelter for native animals. The oak is one of our most iconic trees and the acorn is an easily recognized seed. What you'll be looking for when you're collecting them is an oval shaped seed between one and six centimeters long, which is green in color, but likely to be turning brown as it ripens. You can pick them from an oak tree or collect them from the ground. If you're picking them from a tree, they should be easy to remove from their cap, otherwise they are not ready. If you are collecting them from the ground, Try your best to find ones that are just changing colour and have not yet turned to a very dark brown. You can tell if your acorns are suitable by putting them through a float test. If they sink, they are good to go, but if they float, you can throw them away. They float if there is a hole made by a worm, grub or fungus. This means that floating acorns are not healthy ones. Next, your healthy acorns need to experience the conditions of winter which you can imitate by placing them in a Ziploc bag filled with damp shavings, sawdust or peat and placing the bag in a fridge for 40 to 45 days. If you check on your acorns during this period, you may see them begin to germinate as a root breaks through their outer shell. After this period, you are ready to plant. Give each acorn its own individual pot with some good quality soil and deep enough to allow a good root system to grow. In the time that they are in the fridge, you could collect milk cartons and have your parents help you to cut the ends off to use as pots. Compostable coffee cups will also work, and a compostable cup can be left in the ground when it is time to transfer the seedling. Make sure to poke holes in the end of your pot for water to escape. Plant your acorn just below the surface with the root facing down. Make sure to water it regularly and thoroughly. It will take time to show above ground, so don't worry. The plant will develop its roots first. Once it does begin to break the soil, Place it near a window so it can access light. You can track the growth of your seedlings when they do break through the soil with something as simple as a piece of paper where you hold, can hold it against the plant, mark its height with a pencil. When they are ready to go outside, the seedlings will be 10 to 15 centimeters tall and appear to be outgrowing their container. It may be a good idea to place the seedlings outside for a few hours a day before placing them outside permanently to let them get used to the conditions. This is called hardening off. When you are choosing the final planting spot for your oak, consider how large they will eventually become. They will need good space, distance from other plants, so they won't have too much competition for light or moisture. Make sure they have protection from the wind and access to sunlight in order to thrive. Dig a hole around 70 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Place the seedling, roots facing down, into this hole and loosely refill the surface with soil watering straight after planting. It may be a good idea to provide some protective fencing around your tree as it could be a good source of food for herbivores. So thank you for watching. We hope that you've learned a little bit more about some of Ireland's native animals and that the next time you come to Photo Wildlife Park you might be lucky enough to spot a red squirrel up in a tree.